Well, uh, good evening. We'll, be, uh, we'll get started, and I'll just invite everyone to stand. I'll pray, and uh, we'll get straight into it. Father, we just uh, thank you that we can gather uh, here tonight. Um, we pray that you will uh, shape us um, through your spirit, through your word. Uh, be with us. May we just uh, seek your presence, not just tonight, but throughout the week as well. Um, encourage us and convict us. Amen. from and that is where uh, we learn about our God. So let's read uh, Psalm 23 together. If you've got it in the ESV, that'd be great. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. At the end of verse 3, in that psalm, we see that God has a purpose. God has a purpose for leading his people, and it's for his name's sake. He's concerned about bringing his people into sanctification, into fellowship, for his glory, for our joy. So let's sing two songs together. We're going to sing Only a Holy God and um, Rock of Ages. commands all the hosts of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper in darkness tremble only a holy God what other beauty demands such Splendor I shine the sun. What a majesty rules with justice. Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only Christ.
us could rescue me from my failings? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. Only my holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only Christ. Father, we are your gathered people. Uh, we are called in by you, sanctified and made alive in Christ Jesus by you. And we are gathered for a purpose. We are gathered to sing your praises, to hear the reading and the beauty of your word, to submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ, to have genuine fellowship in the gospel with one another. So I pray that you would bless our time, uh, you would challenge our sin. And you'll make us holy and increase our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing Rock of Ages together. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water from thy wound inside which flows be of sin the double view cleanse me from its guilt and power not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy love seated. Uh, if you've been following the news this week, you've, you're probably carrying a bit of a heavy heart. Um, or if you've given up on listening to the news and you haven't listened to the news uh, in a while, then you probably don't need to be reminded that uh, the world continues to be a crazy place. Uh, one of the main headlines this week, of course, has been the referendum first here in Australia. Um, everyone went and voted yesterday, uh, and yeah, the voice was overwhelmingly defeated. 
personally, I see that as a bit of a good thing, but even so, I still feel like there's so much uh, division, I guess, um, in this country. Even division maybe in, in families or between close friends, and, and that can be quite hard to, to navigate that. Uh, also, the, the conflict uh, between Israel and uh, Hamas continues to escalate. Uh, and it's been really difficult to watch, I guess, some of the scenes coming out of, of both countries there. It's just a really uh, a tragic thing to, uh, to see. And with all the madness and with all the conflict, uh, it feels, it, it genuinely feels like the whole world is, is heading to war. That's, that's what it sort of feels like. Uh, and that's a scary thing to uh, think about. And so that's why uh, tonight I just want to, I guess, call us to prayer. And before we do that, I want to read from uh, Revelations, Revelations chapter 1. I'll go from verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Uh, what we find ourselves in today, it's nothing different in human history. For thousands of years, Christians have had to endure very similar uh, circumstances. They found themselves in the midst of chaos and in the midst of conflict. Uh, and they've turned to passages like this one here. Uh, to find peace in, in biblical truth. Uh, the Apostle, Apostle John, even in the introduction, uh, he, he reminds his readers that Christ is king and that Christ is coming again. And that's something to, to just, you know, release us of all of our uh, anxiety. It's something to find peace in. I'm not going to pretend to know all the ins and outs of revelations and I'm not going to try to piece the world events with, you know, well, that relates to this passage here, and I'm not going to do that. Um, but what's quite clear is that throughout the book of Revelations, uh, the theme of God's throne is prevalent, and that even in all the chaos, uh, God is sovereign over all of it. And so that, again, should just give us peace and comfort as we contemplate that. Uh, so I just want to invite us now to, to stand. Um, I'll leave it. I'll just let it be silent for a couple of minutes uh, where you can pray and then I'll just close off in prayer as well. So let's stand. Thank you. 
Father, just thank you for your awesome grace and your mercy towards us. Uh, we acknowledge that the chaos we often experience is a, a result of our own brokenness and sin. And uh, all the pain and suffering that uh, we see and that we experience, uh, it hurts you too. Um, you love us, you love us the most out of anybody. And, yeah, just can't imagine uh, what it would be like to see the sort of evil that you uh, have had to see uh, in your good world. Just thank you for Jesus and for what he's done to redeem us, to bring us back to you. And I pray that, uh, yeah, that he comes again soon. Uh, help us to have faith to persevere. Help us to have empathy to those who are going through tough times and uh, help us to just reach the immediate needs of people where we can. Also just pray for your spirit to be at work in this world and uh, as we just go through our day-to-day -day lives that you will just uh, continue to be present with us. Come Lord, come. Amen. Let's sing another two songs and Greg. Oh, continue to stand, sorry. Uh, we're going to sing In Christ Alone and uh, His Mercy is Long. Um, the first line is, in Christ alone my hope is found, and this is, this reflects Josh, Josh's message, right, that whenever we see the world and in its trouble and its, in its suffering, we recognise that Christ is still king, that he still reigns. So, let's sing together. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, from through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of we 
Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love could Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. 
Caleb and the musicians for leading us. It's wonderful to be able to um, have our hearts focused and turn towards God. Um, I had a lovely afternoon today. We had my, um, uh, actually my two brothers both came over for uh, lunch. It was nice to catch up with my oldest brother who uh, uh, lives up in Queensland now, but um, it's great that they come down and say hello every so often, and uh, we shared together. One thing I was focusing on this week um, when I was away with work, I was thinking about um, my, my faith, what I believed, and... I find that when I go away that there is um, so many distractions with my work. Um, my day begins at about five o'clock and generally it doesn't wind up until oh, maybe eight o'clock or 8.30 at night time. And I was kind of contemplating very late this week um, how does my life speak my faith? And it made me um, I guess have some time of reflection. And I just want to share a few things tonight which was my reflection on, um, on my faith. And w what is it? You know, what's its value? And what do I do with it? And the title of what I wanted to share tonight, I've called A Faith Worth Sharing. A Faith Worth Sharing. And of course, there's many ways to share. We can share in what we say. We can share in how we react, how we respond to circumstances. We can share in how we act, how we react. And I wanted to look this evening, if we can, together. I, I kind of want to do this more as a study rather than as a, as a message because there's a lot of details that um, I think it's important for us to kind of have a bit of a focus on. Um, if you don't mind following along with me, I might do a bit of reading, but that's okay. Um, I'd like to use a lot of scripture references, which I think is, is a good thing. So I guess firstly we'll begin by reading a passage out of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, from verses 7 to 12. Of course, it's up on the screen. Um, a lot of people like to flick through their Bibles, which is terrific, um, but whichever way. Let's just read it together. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love, and self-control. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own, thank you, <laughs> I'll read that verse again, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. 
and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day, what has been entrusted to me. So here we have Apostle Paul writing, speaking to Timothy. And I believe that he is speaking to us as well. I know that as I read this, I, I sense that he was speaking to me. And when we talk about our faith, we kind of have a num- or two alternatives, really. I was going to say a number of alternatives, but really just two alternatives. We either believe in God or we don't believe in God. They're the two alternatives that we have. And if we don't believe in God, generally we believe in something else or someone else. We can either accept that the Bible is true the inspired word of God, or otherwise the Bible is a book of fables and fairy tales. C.S. Lewis, um, his name gets mentioned quite often because for those who don't know, he wrote, the, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and also he wrote this book called Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis grew up in the Church of England, uh, sorry, Church of Ireland, Now, very high, kind of Anglican-type church. But during his teen years, and, um, you know, many of you are not that far out of your teen years, young adults, um, maybe this is a situation that you've worked through as well. He became a disbeliever. He became a doubter. He became a sceptic. But in his early 30s, Things changed for C.S. Lewis and he put his faith in Christ and he became a very strong defender of faith. And in this book, Mere Christianity, he writes so much about that and he writes this particularly about the person of Jesus. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must never say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, I like this, on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for being a fool, you can spit at him and maybe even kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about him being a great human teacher alone. He's not left that option open to us, and he did not intend to. I want to look this evening at three elements or aspects of this faith, which I have, and I believe that the majority of you here have. And if not, listen along, because I believe that you should be challenged 
by what is being said. Firstly, we have a faith that is worth looking into. And this is a really interesting part of how do I share my faith? You know, is it a fairy tale kind of thing or does it hold some real substance that people can investigate, people can consider, people can think about and walk away with some form of confidence that there is really some truth in what they have considered. But remember that truth can be either relative or it can be absolute. Let me give you some examples. If truth was relative, then you would have to say in mathematics, and I think we'll get this one, that 2 plus 2 may equal 4, but it also may not equal 4. Okay, if truth was relative, it may equal 4 or it may not equal 4. In fact, in chemistry, H2O may be water or it may not be water. All right, if it's all relative, it's, 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 it could be one or the other. And in theology, you could say that God exists some of the time. He doesn't exist some of the time. That's if you consider truth to be relative to something else. However, if truth is absolute, and I believe that the word of God is an absolute truth, and we can say with confidence, right from the first verse of Genesis, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's the beginning of the word of God that we know as our Bible. And if we believe that that is the absolute truth, then that is a faith that we can have confidence in. That when we interrogate it, when we consider it, then we can have confidence in that. And we see here in 2 Timothy, in those six verses that we read, that Apostle Paul doesn't lay claim to being solely responsible for any of the outcomes or any of the um, situations that he presents in those verses. In fact, in verse 12, he says very clearly, I am convinced that he, God, is able to guard what he has entrusted to me. So all that Apostle Paul is saying here is not because of himself. And he had a miraculous conversion. And he, he um, you know, had a, had, a, had a ministry or ministries that, you know, wouldn't even come close to anybody that lives today. And yet he says... I am convinced that it is God who entrusted these to me. Now, that's a wonderful basis for a faith. But what it does, it convinces me that I need to look at my faith from God's point of view. Christianity is about a person. It's not about a religious group. It's not about a church group. It's not about a philosophy. It's not about a denomination. It's about the person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a wonderful foundation, a wonderful foundation to have. Richard Dawkins, in God Delusion, says that the Christian faith is a non-thinking faith. He believed that religion was responsible for the 9-11 bombings and he wrote this, get rid of God and all religions and you will have peace on earth.
Many today believe that that is the way forward, that science and that philosophy and that education is displacing God, that God is no longer important. God is no longer um, an element of our life that is significant. In fact, it can be dismissed. But they say that because they believe that God's non-existence is fact. They believe that God's non-existence is fact. Therefore, because Christianity is based on faith and atheism is based on fact, the latter is a better option. And therefore, they come to that conclusion that life is better without God. However, when we consider it, atheism is also about having faith. It's just putting your faith in the wrong place. A discussion between an atheist and a Christian might go something like this. So just pardon me, I'm hopefully not going to fall off the stage. When I'm on this side, I'm the atheist, okay? When I'm on this side, I'm the Christian. I right, remember that. There is no God. Are you sure about that? Can you prove it? I don't need to, just look around. It's obvious. Okay, well, humour me. Prove it. Well, actually, I can't prove it with certainty, but I know that it's the best option. Okay, I see. Um, so what you're saying is that you can't prove that there's no God, but that you believe the non-existence of God is the most likely option. That's right, of course. Um, so atheism is a belief then? In Acts chapter 17, we have Apostle Paul speaking to the intellectual philosophers who were in Athens. Um, just, before we read, just before we read that verse, um, oh, sorry, read these verses. Thanks very much, um, Daniel, if you could please bring up... Um, I do want to read from verse 19, but just drop down to verse 22, I think it is. No, that's it. That's it. No, 21. All right. Uh, I did like this description. I hope there's none of us here who do this. Um, halfway through verse 21 there, it says, um, those who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. What a life that is, huh? Sitting down, just talking and saying something new. I don't think there's anybody here like that. I think we have more commitments. Anyway, let's read what happens um, back on Mars Hill in Athens. Verse 17, if you would, Daniel, please. And they took him, that is Apostle Paul, and they brought him to... Oropagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Isn't that a great inquiring mind? These people who hadn't seen or heard or knew of Apostle Paul at all, here they were because they'd heard something new and they'd heard something that was different that they wanted to know more about these things. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, 
I perceive that in every way you are very religious. And don't we seem to fall in that trap sometimes? For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. So Apostle Paul was explaining to these Athenians and to those foreigners who were there asking him, you know, what are you talking about? What's this new, new philosophy, if you like, that you're presenting? And P Apostle Paul was talking about Jesus, who was the son of God, who not only had he been crucified, but he was raised from the dead as a promise to all who believed. And that's the same promise that we have today. It's a wonderful foundation that we can base our faith on. We can look into God's word. We can question what God is, has written to us. And we know that because the word of God is the truth, that it is a sound foundation for us. And when our faith is challenged, and it will be, it will be, doesn't matter what stage of life we're in, if we ever share our faith or share our life with non-believers, we'll find that we will be challenged and our faith will be challenged. So we need to be confident in who we believe, what we believe, and why we believe it. And it is a faith that is worth believing. In the middle of verse 12, Daniel, if you would jump back, please, to 1 Timothy chapter, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Right in the middle of this verse, Apostle Paul says this. For I know whom I have believed. Apostle Paul was confident, 100% confident of who he believed. And that's something that you and I can be as well. What is faith? A Sunday school teacher said to her class, a young boy in a class, and I can imagine it was one of these in the front here, a young boy in a class shot his hand up and answered, believing something that you know isn't true. Huh, how did that translate? Hopefully well. Faith is believing something you know isn't true. I mean, that, obviously that's uh, not right, but it, I guess, teaches us a lesson that the faith that we have needs to be based on truth. It's not like we're blindfolded and we're stepping off the edge of a stage or we're, um, you know, just blindly doing something that we're not sure what the uh, destination is going to be. But our faith has a firm foundation. It's a foundation of truth. It's a foundation on Jesus, the Son of God. Paul Little in his book, Know Why You Believe. It's a great little book. It's not very thick. Well worth reading. He says, believing something doesn't make it true. A thing is true or not 
regardless of whether anyone believes it. If you ask people on the street, does God exist? What kind of answers do you think you'll get back? I don't mean in the church here, but I mean you go out in the street or in the school, you know, people will come back and say, um, oh, maybe, oh, I don't know, or oh, I'm not sure, um, oh, I think so, but there's no, if they don't know Jesus is their personal saviour, then they can't confidently say, yes, God exists. But as a Christian, we have a faith because of the object of our faith. Okay, we have a sound faith because of the object of our faith. And the object of our faith is? That's a question for the audience. Come on, someone. Say that again, Joe. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the object of our faith and therefore our faith can be sound. In verses 9 and 10, if you would please, Daniel, Apostle Paul clearly states that our salvation in calling is not of our doing. He says this, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which has now been manifested through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's not because of us, but it's because of God. Because of who Jesus is, then we can have confidence that we have a faith that we can rely on and we have a faith that we can believe in. But we also have a faith that we should share. And I guess it's been... I look back at my... I guess uh, I might as well be honest, 63 years of life. I was going to try and say something less, but, you know, I've got to be honest. And I question myself, how... Have I shared my faith? In eternity, how many people will come up to me and tap me on the shoulder and say, Hey, Greg, thanks for introducing me to Jesus. Now, we don't know, okay, how many people are going to be doing that. I don't know. But it has encouraged me over the last week to be much more active in sharing my faith. And Apostle Paul touches on this in verses 7 and 8 of this same chapter where he says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear. And it is one of the elements that I experience. Okay? I do feel fear and um, anxiety, you know, at the time that I know that I should be sharing my faith. But Apostle Paul encourages us and says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the power 
of God. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Apostle Paul says this. I don't know whether Daniel's going to keep up with me. He's doing pretty well. It's very good. Verse 16. Thank you, Daniel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, if they aren't words of encouragement, I haven't read any for a long time. There's no need for us to be fearful. There's no need for us to be ashamed of sharing our faith because it is the Holy Spirit in us working through the good news, through the gospel that speaks to others. You don't have to prove your faith because there's, you know, there's really um, you know, no scientific proof or evidence about God and his existence and Jesus. Yes, there's historical uh, records and probably the best of historical records about Jesus, his birth, his death and his resurrection. But it is the power of God through the gospel that speaks to those people that you share with. And as Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, though you have not seen him, and I don't think any of us here have actually seen him in the flesh, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. It's the love of God and his glory that motivates us to share the faith that we have. And sometimes we get a little bit enthusiastic about it. Sometimes we get a little bit aggressive about it, actually. Um, I remember one, let's call it, I won't say encounter, but it was a moment that I, somebody actually questioned me about my faith. And my response almost was, well, it's obvious. And, And my response was kind of almost in a belligerent way and we're reminded in first uh, sorry first peter chapter 3 verse 15 it says but in your hearts honor christ the lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you And then this little, 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 little sentence after this. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I'd forgotten that. Let's remember that it's not our convincing, it's not our twisting that causes people to turn to the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to the heart of the person who you are sharing your faith with. Accepting Jesus is not dependent on our intellect. Accepting Jesus is dependent on our heart. And as we live our life, we actually live our faith. Everything we do, everything we say, everywhere we go, it expresses our faith in Jesus Christ. So I believe that we who know Jesus as our personal saviour, we can be confident in our faith because it has a very sure foundation. 
And therefore, we should be sharing that faith with those in our life, those who we come across, circumstances where people will ask where you get the opportunity to share. I should be doing that. We should be doing that. And I did say that uh, there may be some here who don't know the Lord as their personal saviour. And I don't know. All right, I look around and I've been looking all night to see if I can identify somebody who doesn't yet know the Lord as their saviour. And I don't think I can see anyone that I know. But, but you know in your hearts, if you are or if you're not. And if you don't know the Lord as your personal saviour, let me encourage you to take the next step. And why I say the next step is because you're here tonight. You may just be here because of Chushka Che, I'm not sure. But, you know, probably you're here because you're kind of investigating or you're intrigued or you're interested to know about this Lord Jesus of ours. And it's great that you're here. But let me urge you, let me encourage you to take that next step. Believe, believe that Jesus is not just a great moral teacher because that's the wrong thing to believe, but that he is the son of God. He is the free gift of God. He was given in love to us. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again to give us confidence as believers for eternity. And you must make a choice. Well, actually, in fact, you've already made a choice. It's just whether you've made the right choice. And if you are in this situation, let tonight be the beginning of a new chapter in your life. Don't let the opportunity pass. Take the opportunity tonight to inquire of God. Take the opportunity to come before him and acknowledge his free gift to you. May God bless you all as we consider these things. Amen. Thanks, Caleb.
our soul as we uh, endure the hardships of life. We thank you for uh, the faith that you have given us, as we've read tonight, not by our works, but uh, by your mercy and your grace. Give us the courage to share this faith with, with those that we love around us. Amen. <laughs> 